am Orlando Jones, and I just want you to know that the Moana Nui podcast will be starting soon. Stay tuned, yo. I'm Veronica Taylor. I'm from myself and Ash Ketchum. I just want to say, Moana Nui, I choose you. Aloha, everyone, and thank you for joining the Moana Nui podcast. We're so excited for you to be joining us for tonight's episode. If you watch our series, uh, you know every month at uh, this time of the month, we have our Develop Your Talents um, episode with Sue Ann Hong with the Center for Asian Pacific American Women. Um, we're so excited to talk about today's topic topic. But of course, before I introduce our guests, um, I wanted to give a few announcements. Um, first, our, our friends at Freestyle Comics, they are getting ready for their FSK Con, uh, a comic event that's been growing since the start of this uh, indie comic. Uh, it's going to be taking place at a local school in Columbus, um, Ohio where they're going to be having art, comics, games, contests, presentations, panels, and so much more. Uh, it's a great event uh, to geek out, learn about future careers, and see characters that look like you. Uh, it is both in person if you're in the Ohio area and a virtual event. Um, uh, so you can join uh, whichever way is comfortable for you. Uh, if you want to keep up uh, to date um, of all the events that they will be having going on, uh, you can go to their Facebook event uh, page where you can um, uh, follow that and get all the updates of everything going on, all the panels and how you can watch virtually or attend in person uh, and also a, another a quick announcement, uh, starting today, our friend Cosplays by Shinobi uh, has uh, a new Kickstarter called uh, Captain Zero Into the Abyss. Um, they're doing a part two to this uh, short film, uh, and it's deep and it's deep. Oh, excuse me. It's deep, a uh, deeper dive into the world and the psyche of of the main character. Um, this is an animated series, and it stars Angela Ross, Keith David, uh, Zoli Griggs, uh, Cody Galloway, and Martin Toro, uh, Toro, who are going to be voicing several characters in the series. So, if you're a fan of any of those um, actors and actresses. Definitely support this Kickstarter. Uh, it's going on now for the next 30 days to raise money to um, create the second part. And just go to the link that is in your comment section um, to check out the Kickstarter, learn more about it, and see how you can support. And now let's get ready to introduce our, our panel. First, we're going to introduce uh, the fairy godmother of talent development uh if you've watched her show before we've you know she, she has been deemed this by the show and many others uh she's a wonder woman of our time uh doing so much within the community helping develop so many women uh, across the continent um uh, with her cohorts um and her different programs and conferences so please help me welcome sue ann hong from the Center of, of Asian Pacific American Women. Welcome, Sue Ann. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Dana, for that wonderful introduction. I almost feel like I need an outfit for that fairy godmother situation. Yes, so we'll have to talk yes about you do. It. Yeah, I'm like, you I need that, that with, with a little Superman you know, <laughs> symbol right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm very excited. Um, you know, tonight's episode is really, uh, really with my friends. And yes. so I can't wait to uh, to have this uh, round table. But please go ahead and introduce these awesome ladies. 
Well, uh, we're definitely excited about our round of uh, our panelists that we have. The first panelist we have is Marcy Thomas. Uh, she is the vice president, uh, portfolio loan manager with Grandbridge Real Estate Capital LLC. Uh, and she's been with them for 23 plus years of, she had, well, excuse me, she has 23 plus years of experience in commercial loan servicing assets and portfolio management. Uh, she also is a United Way VIP alumni, board member of the Golf Women Mean Business Foundation, and a volunteer with the Family Selection Committee for Atlanta Habitat for Humanity. Uh, and of course, you know, she is involved with so many other things uh, in the past, including the board of of the Georgia Center of Death and Hard of Hearing Member Services Committee of the Southeast Real Estate Investment Advisory Council and so much more. So please help me welcome Marcy Thomas. Thank you for the warm welcome, Dana, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for being here. Uh, and our next panelist is Melva, uh, Melva Holt. She is the CEO and founder of Pace Leadership. And she, she is an experienced HR executive with over 18 years of corporate experience within the consumer products and industrial distribution industries. Uh, she is a CIF accredited associate certified coach and a certified master coach through the Center of Coaching Certification. Uh, she also has a Hogan Assessment, Five Behaviors, and a Rejuve Certification Provider. So please help me welcome Melva Holt uh, back to the show again. Hi, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Thank you for Thank that welcome. You. Welcome again. And last but certainly not least, our uh, our third panelist is Jennifer Kinsinger. Uh, Kinsinger. Uh, she has spent 32 years at State Farms. Um, sorry, there's a net. <laughs> State Farm. Uh, um, issues at State Farms uh, in various leadership and corporate roles in the United States and Canada. Uh, as a leader and mentor, she, she had a passion for developing talent and leading effective, engaging, and productive teams. Uh, she has successfully executed and led employees through several large organizational changes while maintaining a focus on outstanding customer service. And right now, she is tackling a new uh, career in her life. She is enjoying the new career of retirement. Let us welcome Jennifer to the show tonight. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Um, Sue Ann is not letting me retire, obviously. So um, I'm here to spend some time with you guys tonight, and I'm really excited about it. Well, you're just retired from corporate America. You're now in a different form of uh, uh, of a new career now. <laughs> Absolutely, 100%, and it's great. <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Sue Ann so we can dive in to the what are the gotta haves for your the job and career. Uh, hand it over to you, Sue Ann. Thank you so much, Dana. And everyone, just so you know why I actually invited these three amazing leaders tonight is because they all have a very different back path and they have different ways of, of how they've gotten to where they've got to. So I wanted them to share their story because what I'm finding is that there is no one way to get somewhere in terms of your career, but there is some things that are important, I think, to consider when you're thinking about a job or career and the fact that there are things that ignite your passions and you're going to see that with our panelists tonight. So let me start off with Marcy first. Marcy, can you share with the group just your personal background first and maybe a little bit about your family? Just uh, get us started. 
Sure. Thanks, Sue Ann. Um, you know, I'll tell you, uh, I, I'm a late bloomer and um, I'm always the junior person in the room, which is a blessing to soak up the energy and, and learn from so many wonderful people in my career. Um, I started in commercial real estate 20 something years ago, knowing nothing about uh, commercial real estate, but had people in the organization to teach me. Um, I'm not a job hopper. So my 20 something years have spanned only two companies, but with acquisition and mergers. It's had various different names, but really only two companies over this time, um, but not two jobs, not two roles, um, but just staying dedicated to those companies. Um, you know, in that time, I, I, I did not have my undergrad degree. I was always quite uh, embarrassed that I hadn't finished. So um, I just stuck to it and got my undergrad at 40 and decided that time is scarce. So I'm not going to spend any more time in the classroom uh, pursuing my master's or anything further. I probably should have three PhDs with all the credit hours I have uh, over those years. <laughs> but um, I took on getting my designations in the industry that I'm in and doing that to be the subject matter expert and surrounding myself again with people that uh, laid the, the groundwork before me. Uh, one thing that uh, Dana hadn't mentioned, which is kind of new to my my uh, portfolio these days, is I've taken on in the industry through the Mortgage Bankers Association the role of DEI vice chair, uh, which I am so humbled to be able to be part of in my industry of white man banking world um, and that transformation that that's happening in, in that space, as well as uh, the philanthropic chair for one of our subcommittees. So I've learned in all of these years that service leads that I did not get here without people um, assisting me. So in my pursuit of uh, the next chapter of my career is helping next generation through mentoring and uh, giving back of time and talent. Well, first of all, congratulations on your new role, but that capacity continue to expand, Marcy. I know, uh, I don't know. Have you said no to anything before? I'm just saying. <laughs> I, I do. I, when I step back, you take one step back and I get two more things added to my plate. But you know what, Sue Ann, that's a really good point is that you resize your day, your week, your life for the things that you're most passionate about. That's right. And so this is a great infusion of energy for me to go back to home base and whatever I'm doing to feel really excited about, you know, the impact that I can have uh, just sharing my story and love hearing it. the stories of Melva and Jennifer. So thank you. I love it. Thank you, Marcy. Melva. Yes. Um, so I'm inspired by your story, Marcy. So thank you so much. I love being here and meeting other wonderful women. For me, um, I would say I'm on my third career um, now at this point in time, which is, um, I can remember being asked what I wanted to do when I grew up in high school and college. And I was always like, grow up. Like, what does that mean? I have no idea. So I always say I reserve the right to change my mind. And I only, you know, every five years. So let's keep going. Um, so a little bit about my career. I um, went to school, got my undergrad in chemical engineering um, and started right out of college at uh, a large organization working in a manufacturing facility um, as an engineer, learning how to do all the things that I had studied for a number of years. Um, I worked, um, started leading people in maybe about the year, first year point in my career and um, stayed leading people and doing engineering a little bit on the side for the next three years. So I spent about four years in that overall. And then I said, you know what, there's something else I wanted to do. I had no idea that it was called HR, but I knew there were things I enjoyed doing. And someone actually had to share with me, well, that's actually what HR does. I knew I liked developing people. I knew I liked, um, you know, really kind of doing what we would call culture work. Um, at this point in time, I don't know what we were calling it back then, um, but they pointed me to HR and that started a career in HR, which was another 14 years. Um, and then uh, just three and a half, just over three and a half years ago, I left corporate America to start um, my own leadership development uh, firm. And so that's what I do today. And for me, it's all about how do I help people reach their potential and, and specifically, how do I grow organizations and help them build cultures of accountability and inclusion um, 
through empowering and skilling up their mid-level managers. Because all those 18 years that I spent, what I saw over and over was there's such an opportunity um, to serve a group that doesn't get served very often. And so that's my passion. Um, and, and so, Marcy, you said, you know, you kind of resize things to fit where your passions are. And I totally agree with that. I talk about I'm intentionally busy. Um, I'm very intentional with my time. I have three kids, husband as well. So um, there's a lot going on for me most of the time. Um, but I really like showing up in places where I feel like I can help others grow and be who they need to be based on their true desires. So um, that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Melva. I love the fact that you've deliberately pivoted and we're going to hear more about that. But also she did not mention she has twins, twin yeah. girls. And I got a chance to see one of them dance a couple weeks ago. So that was amazing. So um, Jennifer, let's share about your story. Now, I know you didn't expect to be in front of a camera again, but, <laughs> you know, once it's you're okay. in circle, you know, I pull you in and you don't get out, right? It's I know it's one of those things <laughs> and I'm used to it by now. I've known you a long time. And um, so a little bit like Marcy in the fact of one or two companies, I really worked for State Farm for 32 years, but in many capacities. I started out my career out of college and um, I was not a specific major. So I was a political science major. So what do you do with that, right? Law school or who, who the heck knows? So at the time I came to State Farm, I really wasn't, didn't know what I wanted, right? You're young, you're, you know, 21, 22 years old. And I was like, oh, it's a job. I think I can do that. I'm not really sure what it is, but let's go. And I ended up in an organization and in a place that I found a, a, primarily in the claims department that I loved. It ignited the customer service piece of me. I was working with people, um, climbed some roofs in the early days and heaven forbid, we'll never do that again. <laughs> but, um, but I found within that organization, a culture that worked to develop people and that was something that was important to me as well. And I like to pay that forward. And I think throughout my career, that was the thing I always tried to do. I went into leadership pretty early in my career and then moved through. Uh, I, held, I couldn't hold a job. That was always my joke when I moved to a new one is, well, I can't hold a job. I held one for a few years and I've moved on to another. But it was amazing opportunities. And I got a chance to see different parts of the organization. I got to interact with different people. Um, you had to make a lot of choices along the way. And that's one of the things I think, especially as people get into their mid careers, they start to look at what matters to me, what makes me feel good about coming to work every day. And, you know, you hit that. I even, I hit that point in my career where I was like, where do I want to go with this? What's, where can I make a difference? And at, I hit a point where I recognized that developing people and leading people was what made me happy. And if you're happy in your work and your career, you make a difference to other people. And then you get to see, you know, I watched young folks come in behind me and then some of them leapt ahead of you. And that I was so proud of that. And it was, as I look back on my career, that, that was the biggest thing, that passion about what I did and the difference that I made to other people and um, hoping that they're paying it forward too, right? As, as they develop in their careers. Um, I'm now, I think Sue Ann noted that I recently did, you know, actually kind of officially retire. And so now I'm in a kind of a second phase of career, right? That will happen to some of you at some point in time. And it's now it's what's really fun, right? And you start honing in on what else do you like to do? And I spent a little bit of time for a couple of years and I went out of the claims arena into the sales side of insurance and working in commercial. And that opened up a whole new world, met a whole group of new people when I moved here to the Myrtle Beach area. Um, you know, and then, you know, education, continuing ed. I um, still do that. I even found recently that I can take university college courses in South Carolina for free because of my age. <laughs> so, um, but I, but as a career, you know, I, 
I've moved a lot of places. Um, one of the things maybe we'll get to it somewhere along the way is that in some organizations, mobility becomes a big thing. And that was one of the things I had to grapple with, with family. I have a daughter that's now grown and married, but you know, when they're young, how do you do that? And does that work for you? And what, what are the limitations that you have at, by choice, right? And how do you live with those? Or how do you make decisions about that's what's right for me? And then what kind of career decisions do you make from there? I love and it. And now I'll shush. <laughs> well, all three of you are in different places in career. And I think that's what I wanted to, you know, uh, demonstrate because this is there again, there is not one path, but there are ways to get to success. So Marcy, how do you define success? Like when you look at your career, how do you define that? Joy. You know, for me, it is, do I regret the decisions I've made and where I'm at? Or do I feel joyful about where I am and my, my surroundings? I really like what Jennifer said when she let off about it being the right culture for you. Because um, our stories are all so different, but um, picking an organization, whether it's a career, a volunteer position, a job, a leadership role, a board, it's got to be the right culture for you. And so I define success for myself by not my paycheck, not the, um, you know, the retirement plan, not the flexibility of, you know, telecommuting versus in office. It's am I fulfilled with the work that I'm doing? And am I proud to be able to share that story with others? And I wouldn't replace that for anything. So I, I feel like I'm in a successful place. Are there people that have outpaced me? Sure. Are there people that are still trying to play catch up? Yes, their story is not my story, nor vice versa. So I think that when I stopped looking left and right and I stayed in my own lane, I really could measure the success between me and my own finish line, not me and others. I love that, Marcy, because you're defining what success is for yourself that has nothing to do with other people. And then the second thing I loved what you said about is the fact that, you know, you know the fact that you started, you got your degree when you were 40. You know, and you did, you started your career when you started it, you know, it didn't, 20. it wasn't this linear path that you made. How, one thing that I was curious about, how did you get into the commercial side of things? Like, what was the impetus that got you there? So my hand was kind of forced. I started off in residential customer service and, you know, as most financial institutions and banks do mergers, my position was going away and I had just moved to Atlanta. So I'm thinking to myself, do I really want to move up to Virginia right now? I don't know anybody. It was scary. So for the right position, I guess further along in your career, you take those chances and turn them into opportunities. But I was bright eyed, bushy tailed, didn't know anything about anything. And so there was an opportunity to move from commercial, from real, um, from residential. And it's kind of funny because it's like the, um, the it, it was SunTrust Mortgage at the time, come full circle to, to be back in the SunTrust house again with Truist. But um, it was, I, I don't know what I'm doing here and do I want to continue. And this headhunter came in and interviewed all of the personnel that were being displaced. And everyone was so impressed for going out for a fancy lunch and bringing their resumes and looking their best. And I come in um, again, not knowing the business accoutrement of how to conduct <laughs> yourself in some of these interviews. Um, and so the question is, where do I see myself in five years? And I was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, not even 25 yet. I don't know where I see myself in five days. But what I'm hoping for is to have a 20 year anniversary lunch with a company one day. And the woman just wrote me off as, and just dismissed me as being just ridiculous. And I said, wait a second. I never said I want to do the same job for 20 years. I said, I'd like the opportunity for a partnership. If it's mutually beneficial in a right to work state like Georgia, why can't I stay and celebrate a successful career? And she did not place me at the organization where she, she was placing everyone else. One of the VPs at SunTrust was coming over to commercial. I had worked on one project with him to help a client. This was when we had microfilm and microfiche and go back and research <laughs> loan histories and all of them. And I was committed to not punching the clock, get the job done, find the, the situation, the problem for the, the client. 
And he was impressed by one interaction, one project together that he sent my resume over and got me an interview. So that's how I took the leap, uh, starting something I never imagined would turn into where I am today. I love it. I love that because, you know, the fact that you're, you shined and somebody noticed and recognized, and that was a huge opportunity. So I love that. And there are people who write you off and it's unfortunate, but they only, they don't go deeper into the beyond the no. surface, right? So, and the true thing here, Suran, is you shine when you're not expecting to, when you are your authentic mm -hmm. self and yeah. doing the best job. If I had tried to, if I had been looking to impress others, I mean, I, people see through that on, automatically, I think. And she knew I was going to be a flight risk. She knew, I'm going to send these people to this company. And she's going to call me every single day when she gets laid off in 60 days from now and say, this is not a 20-year luncheon, lady. <laughs> so <laughs> it happened for a reason. I love that. Melva, how do you define success in your career? And it's pretty similar to what Marcy said. For me, it's um, do I feel like I, I'm always looking for two things wherever I am at that point. Um, I'm looking for am I in a position where I feel like I can truly, um, you know, offer something, <laughs> you know, offer my skills, offer something that's going to help the organization or help, you know, people in a meaningful way. So I need to be able to contribute at the level I feel like I can contribute at that point in time. And then two, what am I learning? Am I in a position of learning? And so, um, you know, I spent 14 years at one organization and um, navigated, I don't even know how many jobs I had, but every 18 months to three years, I was in a new role. And so that was the way the, the organization operated. It was exciting. It was fun. I honestly thought, what will I do when I have to hold a job for longer than like three years? Um, so I hear you, Jennifer, on that. I didn't know what that was going to be like. Um, and moving, I was always just looking for, I, I what are the tools? Like, what are the new things I'm going to learn and what are the tools that I'll leave that position with on the back end? And so it really kind of helped me keep focused. So for me, that success is always depending on, can I say that I was able to, you know, use my skills to the fullest and on the opposite side, did I learn something? I love that. It's the give, I'm giving you my best and then the learning, the connections uh, and the contributions that it makes a huge difference. Jennifer, how about you? So I'm pretty similar to Melva in in the learning. And yeah, success for me was the difference I made with people. Um, I, if I didn't feel like I was making a difference in the people that I worked with lives, I didn't feel like I was doing enough. And um, so I always felt really good about that. Success for me was also always being able to learn. And I talked a minute ago about I'm still looking to learn. It doesn't matter. I got my master's degree in my 50s. Um, State Farm offered immense opportunities, you know, kind of like you've got the CCIM and CCMS, Marcy, right? I had alphabet soup behind my name as well. I guess I could have put that up there, but um, I did extensive continuing education in my career. So yeah, so success for me was I was happy and I'll throw in my family was happy, right? Because all throughout my career, and I think a lot of people face this, is if that you want all those parts of your lives to work well together, right? Because if they don't, it makes things pretty tough. So my success not only was my career was great and I loved my job. I loved the people like Sue Ann that I worked with. Um, I have relationships and friendships for the rest of my life now because of who I met and who I worked with, but it also encompassed my family as well. It was really important. I took a pause in moving up, if you want to call it, during the years my daughter was in junior high and high school. And I knew at that time when I made that decision to pause that that was a mm, five, six year pause and you could get passed by in those times, but I was really good with that decision and it was okay. And <laughs> A month after she graduated high school, we were off again. I got promoted and off I went. But during that time, I was very deliberate about 
continuing to push myself and offer to do new things and help with different projects. But so success was all those things, right? It was learning. It was balancing that with my family and then just a pure passion and love for what I did and the people that I worked with. It's about creating the whole life is what I'm hearing you it say. Is, it is. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, absolutely. Were you guys aware of your values when you and you decided that you were going to pursue your career, like were, was there specific things you were looking for in terms of aligning with your values? I'm always curious about that because I feel like half the time we're falling into, uh, you know, situations or jobs and things almost accidentally. But I'm curious if, if you guys really thought about that as you were pursuing your career. So whoever wants to answer that first. I'm happy to start. Absolutely. You know, when I think back to um, when I was 22, I was 22 and about to about enter to the it. workforce, I had no clue what value, you know what I mean? I did not have a, a word for it, but I was looking for what felt right. And so I can remember interviewing with companies and going to visit their sites and walking away and they're like, well, we, you know, we want you. And I just would have this feeling of like, Ugh. I can't put my finger on it, but that's not it. And so when I found, um, you know, my first organization, I felt like it was so right. I felt like it was perfect. It was like walking into a warm hug for me. And I was like, oh, this is great. And for me, that was important because it was the exact same feeling I had when I chose the college I went to. So, you know, four years prior, I had a dream school. I just knew I was going there. I showed up on campus and I hated it. And I had obviously applied to other schools, thank goodness. <laughs> and so I went to the school that I just applied to because they waived my fee. <laughs> and I loved science and technology. And I went to this, I, I had been accepted months earlier and it was the last place I visited and it felt the same way. So I knew I had some guidance for that. And, you know, every place that I went, obviously over, you know, 18 years, you love some things. There are places where maybe, you know, you're ready to get out of them a little bit quicker than others. Um, but every single time culture was huge. And for me, if the culture was not what I wanted it to be, I tried to figure out how I could make that place better. So I always wanted to leave a place better than I found it. Um, and insert warmth and authenticity into it and whatever that looked like in that situation. Um, and so when I think about choosing the next company, when I left that 14 years and going to the next place, it was absolutely about that as well. And I will tell you that, you know, what sealed the deal for me there is I remember interviewing and um, I accepted the offer and they were having um, a senior um, HR council meeting and um, I was, I needed to leave on like a Sunday to get there. They were going to start Monday morning and the CHRO called and wanted to speak to my husband and, um, you know, told him he really appreciated, he understood the impact on my family and really appreciated, you know, understanding and, you know, not allowing me, but really understanding that I needed to come out and just being a support there. That was like a game changer. I had never had that happen in my career. So, wow. you know, I knew the values of at least the person, the people I was going to work for, their heart, their values aligned with where I was because family, family is absolutely first for me in every, everything that I do. Um, and so, that was beautiful to see. So it's absolutely been important. I love that. It's like this uh, putting your whole, again, it's the whole life. They're mm -hmm. looking at the whole thing. But also you seem to be pretty good at your gut instincts, listening to your gut early. I don't know if we all trust our gut instincts back then. I'm just saying. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I learned it. And Sue Ann, I will tell you, when I have not followed my gut, the, re the decision is regretted every single time. Now, luckily, I don't have that many, but <laughs> I can tell you every time I haven't followed it, I have regretted that. Yeah, that's a good that's a good thing. We all have to, you know, listen to probably ourselves a little bit more. But Marcy, what about you? What values kind of did those things influence your decisions about career or place to work? 
So because, like I said, there's there's really only been two major organizations I've been with. It was the the subsets of which position within the organization um, best aligned with my my values, my work ethic, and where I would succeed most. Where could I contribute the most? Where would my voice actually be heard? Yeah. Um, it it wasn't so much as an, an, an intuitive voice for me. Um, so much as sometimes um, learning by fire and the bumps and bruises you learn across, along the way. So um, <laughs> in deciding which team to work for, which manager, how long do you stay? Do you pursue another opportunity? Um, I've found, I've discovered about myself, I'm a very dedicated um, teammate. And I'll stick it on, stick it out as long as I need to. If you need me to mop the floors, I'll do that. But you know, there's going to come a point that I'm going to ask you, do I still need to be mopping the floors? This is the best use of my time, but if you need me to do it, I will. Um, so with some managers I've had in the past, I, I knew in my gut this was not my happy place. But, you know, okay, can you change the narrative? Can you make this better? Some situations, yes. Some situations, absolutely not. And I had to make some tough decisions for myself. Is it time to pack up and, and move out? And what do I do at this point? Um, so it wasn't necessarily, oh, I don't know if I feel good about this. I, or I think I feel really good about it. It's I was always learning in these positions. And it's like, halt, break. What just happened here? Who is this nook in my way? And this person is not Team Marcy. And I don't know that I'm going to thrive in this environment. <laughs> So <laughs> to be my chief operating officer is probably the worst job that anyone's ever had because I want an open door, closed door meeting with you right now to talk about some things and then we'll figure out the, the, the best action plan. Like I said, I've never left an organization, right? Um, I well, agree with them. your loyalty is huge. I mean, that's something that you're, and by the way, she's like that with friends too, FYI. <laughs> um, you know, but at the at the end of the day, though, you're still making conscious decision where where you stay within that department or not based on sounds mm -hmm. like how is this going? How does this feel like you're still listening to your gut, even though you're not saying that? Maybe so. I, I, I can see that. Like they leveled up when they got me on their team, quite honestly. <laughs> and. <you> know, <laughs> <laughs> know your worth. Is, know your worth. Know your, Absolutely. Know your worth. But now, let them pay the tax on it too. Know your <laughs> worth. And it's been paid back in spades, immeasurably, because it, it was a learning opportunity not to go unnoticed that there were situations that had to improve. But um, I am where I am today, and probably a more mindful manager and more, I guess, uh, agreeable teammate from having to have some real life scenarios um, because it's not sexy and glorious day in and day out. We're grinding, we're working, uh, we, we have a purpose, but collectively, are is this stealing my joy? Is it rid ridding me of my happiness and is it giving me more stress? Um, I don't mind good stress, but is it giving me negative stress and negative energy? Um, and if so, then you need to change. You need to, you need to make personal changes. You need to make professional changes. But you have to invest in yourself and have the courage to do it. I wish I had the courage that Melva had to be able to say, I'm going to change my career. But you know what? I've been so content, not complacent, but content with it. I haven't had to, had a need to yet. But that doesn't mean that in the next chapter, my journey doesn't change. You know, yes. you have to be open to those possibilities. Absolutely. Paying attention, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, there's no one path for everyone. There's, you know, it just depends on where that leads you, right? That Melva's listening to her gut, you know, big time. And it's it's working for you. You know, Marcy, yeah. you're very strategic about, but evaluating that joy piece. I, I love the fact that you said that even happiness has caused stress. It's so true. You guys, yeah. it is so true. The good things also can cause stress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Promotions can cause stress, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. absolutely. Jennifer, how about you? So, values. So, I probably was much like Melva again in the early years. Not sure I knew what those were. It was more of a gut instinct about this feels right. But as I stayed with an organization and moved into different roles in different areas, 
then you start to realize what's important to you. And, you know, one of the things with the organization I was with was I never felt like I was asked to do something that made me cringe in this. And, and I mean that in the sense of something that felt um, just in the gut wrong, right? Um, stuff, it, it was ethical. It was, let's do what's right. Let If it's gray, let's do that in um, favor of the customer. All, and those were the things that resonated with me and probably kept me in that organization all those years because I always felt like I was doing what was right for the people that worked with me, for me, and the customers we serviced. And I think if any of those, and there were a few times those went a bit of wire. Sue Ann can probably speak to those days, right? And and it didn't feel good. And you, there was a couple times where I said, ooh, if something doesn't change, I'm not sure that this how much longer this is going to last, right? Because then you start to feel that stress, and it's not the good stress. It's the the difficult stress, but then that's where you dug into yourself and you, one, either you were going to make a decision to do something else, or you were going to do probably what I did is I said, okay, well then how can I influence and make a difference? What is it? What are the skill sets I have? What are the, um, you know, the people that I work with that I think we can, you know, shift mindsets and do those kinds of things. And I think those were, those were the ways that I then kind of got back to the place where everything felt aligned with my values again. Yeah. And I was able to do that. So it, again, went into this lengthy career. Um, also from a, I don't know if it's value so much, but it's back to that, what brings you joy. And I had, you know, a few jobs along the way that, yeah, I was like, yeah, this is okay. And I know I'm learning a lot, but I also know I've got to start looking for another opportunity because this is not the place for me to stay. This does not, um, either I think I'm going to hit a wall in learning. I always go back to learning because that's just what makes me happy. And uh, my daughter thinks I'm insane, but she's like, really, mom? But, <laughs> but you know, every time I went back to, yeah, this feels right. And this is what I need to do. This is where I need to go. This is how I have to do it. And then who are the people that can help me? That's another thing. If particularly, well, whether you're with a single organization or you're, you know, you're entering and doing work outside and there goes the dog. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Corgis are tenacious. And, um, but then you start also looking in the organization to who are the people that can help you, Right. That's that whole connection piece. And, and you know, you want to look, I think you want to look at that and, you know, who are the people that you admire maybe? So they're, they're people that you not copy, but right. You look at what did they do with their careers? You reach out to those kind of people and um, all those things. And again, you tend to le go out to people like, you know, Sue Ann's a good friend of mine. And we, I think we have very similar values and, People like that are great to have in the organization because when you reach those hard spots about decisions, you don't have to be alone to make those decisions, right? You can go and you can reach out to peers, people above and below you for guidance and, you know, you dummy or, or hey, you know, here's a good way to approach that. Here's something else to do. So, um, very true. but, but it goes back, it goes back to that. It felt right. And it, um, energized you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was curious, uh, who is the, what, you don't have to name names or anything, but I was curious about who's the best boss you've ever had. And like, what did they do that made you feel like they were the best boss? Jennifer? Yeah, I'm thinking. I can name a few bad ones. <laughs> 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 well, we can talk about that too, but yeah, Arthur, you, know, you, you know what, the ones, the ones that, the one in particular that I can think of in my career was always encouraging and always, but always pushing, right? So just didn't tell you, you did a good job, said you do a great job, but they were also very honest about here's where you have more potential that you're not realizing yet. Mm -hmm. And how, how can we get you there? But let you did a road of self-discovery to get there. Didn't give you the answers. Maybe helped, you know, when you got stuck. But um, the best one I ever have, I did those kinds of things. And it yeah. made a huge difference. 
Yeah, they put they they pushed you a little further than you probably would have, right? Yes. <laughs> Marcy, mm -hmm. how about you? What's the best kind of a boss? Kind of the best. So this this is going to be me being vulnerable, Sue Ann. No sunglasses on my head, not hiding behind anything. Just me sharing, um, which you know for me is kind of hard. I know I'm so so like I I clench it right, and I don't let people into a personal side of me a lot of times. But I'll say it's my current manager and my previous manager before him. I was reassigned back in March of this year, uh, realigned portfolios, things change in, in, you know, in financial institutions constantly. Um, but what I have learned coming out of, you know, the, the COVID uh, hibernation is that I really am more introverted than I thought. So a socially extroverted introvert, I need a lot of downtime. Um, quiet time. I need time to process my thoughts on things. So sensory overload has just uh, kind of taken over for me, my anxiety and um, a little PTSD. I can share this because it's October and it's Employee Disability Awareness Month, but there are different challenges I'm faced with today that um, I hadn't dealt with with years before. Um, so having a a very supportive team, having very supportive management that I can approach with these vulnerabilities and share that sometimes may not be the best days, um, but holding me true to what I need and like being that lifeline. Like we have a weekly scheduled video call and sometimes I need that. I'm a little detached being here all by myself working, which I enjoy, you know, the process, the style of it, but I still need to engage. Um, I just don't need an overwhelming situation. If we have a conference, I need to know that, you know, and I'm speaking on a panel, it's going to go great. I'll have somebody there supporting me, but I'm going to need to have a few days of decompression time. Like I can't just constantly be on go and, and be on, on that being mindful of don't stack up my calendar with calls all day because it's going to exhaust me. So I've um, really found it very helpful to have my two most recent managers, given the state of climate and change and everything in organizations these days, to be my advocate to, I can thrive, I can perform better, because I have someone who I can talk to, who understands and is compassionate in ways that I think that we weren't years and years ago. Marcy, you bring up something that um, I was at a NAP event today, and there were one of the speakers said, you know, a lot of times corporations look at people like assets versus people. And what you're bringing out is the fact that you're addressing the person first. And that person has all kinds of things going on. <laughs> and to be able to be sensitive to those needs so that they can be at their best. I think that's huge. I, I think that that especially after COVID, that's almost should be a requirement, you know, but uh, thanks for sharing and being vulnerable. I appreciate that. Melva. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, I've had um, really two that came to mind and for very different reasons. Um, the first person who came to mind um, was someone that I felt like really saw me for the first time mm. um, and saw me both at the human level saw potential that I had and um, gifted me with feedback to help me pull that out. Um, and then also advocated and cleared space for me to actually be able to do that. And so um, very powerful um, to have someone who gets you. Um, the pieces of me that they didn't understand, they were curious about and wanted to learn. Um, and there's a lot going on in this world, <laughs> um, as there still is today. Um, but at that particular time, that really hit home. And so I really appreciated the care um, and the concern for me um, and then how how they helped me to build my career from that point. Um, so that's the first person who came to mind. Then the second person um, was um, someone who... Honestly, everybody has said that this is like, this person is incredibly tough to work with. We don't know how you're going to do it. 
when I was interviewing for the job, this is the toughest person. We, you know, are you going to deal with that? Okay. And I found that individual to be just fine. We had a wonderful relationship and we built trust really quickly. And I was just given autonomy out of this world. Like I was just trusted to lead and be strategic and do the things that I was brought in to do with, you know, obviously, you know, discussing and I have to bring people along, but like just trust it fully to do what I needed to do. So I had a freedom that I hadn't felt before my career, like in that way. So you know, those two, I I wouldn't be the person with the autonomy if it weren't for the first person who helped to cultivate me into truly showing up and developing and being comfortable with, with what my superpowers are and being able to bring those to bear. I love the fact that you started off with, by saying I felt seen, you know, and I mean, I know that's something that we've talked about. And, uh, and I think that that's huge because you don't want to be just a number right? And what do they say? Like, they always say that you leave your boss, you don't leave the company, right? And that is true. I've experienced that myself personally. But uh, thank you for sharing that. I was also curious, since Jennifer brought it up about the bad bosses, (laughs) one quality, one quality that you're like, I cannot, I can't work for this person. One quality. What is it? They lied. Ooh, integrity. Yeah, I I go the same way because I was gonna say I couldn't trust them. Mm. Trust, integrity, yep. Marcy. For me, it was rigidness, not being open-minded um, to other people have possible uh, contributions and knowledge. Just it's my way or the highway type of mentality. Yeah, I love that. That also, and I'm gonna say it's all about me, kind of a boss. I were I was like really, you know, it's a very up, they can manage upward very well, but they they're you know not very good with the people. So yeah, it's all about self awareness. Yeah, the lacking of self awareness. Oh my gosh, and they continue to get promoted, right? Um, really? <laughs> so, yeah. So let me ask you this: How do you manage? How are you managing your whole life? Like, give me some examples of what are you doing to manage? Your life. You guys all hinted at different things, but I want to kind of be a little bit more explicit. So how do you do that? What are you doing? Nobody's managing their life. Okay. No, it's a complete disaster. (laughs) It's not a disaster. It's a (laughs) kaplama. Okay. (laughs) How are you? Give me an example of how are you doing it? So I talked about this a little bit earlier about this intentionality that I have to my time. And I've definitely felt like um, at different times, my my life was out of balance. Um, and, you know, my family suffered for those times when my life was out of balance. Um, because unfortunately, it was never out of balance the other way, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so I, the reason I was hesitating to speak first is because right? I own my own company now. So I am in complete control of my time. And um, early on in this thing, I remember having a day where I was just like, oh, that felt like very corporate like, like I, I just was drained and I was over programmed for the day and go, go, go. And I sat with myself and said, the only reason that can happen is if you do it, like nobody else is doing it to you at this point. Mm. I allowed that to happen. And so I had to get really clear and serious with myself on. So I'm building the life that I want. And so I build the life that I want. So, um, you know, I've mentioned my family. Uh, Sue Ann mentioned that I have twin daughters and and a son. Uh, so there's three, three of them, all teenagers who are very busy in life right now. And, um, you know, my husband and I are running businesses and we are just on the go all the time. But when you look at my calendar, what has to be done for family is, is blocked and it is protected sacredly. 
I also have my time protected so I can have peace of mind. So I'm not run ragged um, between, you know, delivering for clients, running a business, family, but to make sure that I take care of myself within that as well. So for me, it really is being true to what I need, understanding where I am, knowing what my quirks are. I know when my high energy levels are and I protect those so I can be creative within them. I know like, hey, I need to be here with my kids. So I'm not, you know, skirting up. I protect that time. Occasionally, I, you know, if I'm out of town or something, I have to deal within that. But I don't want to look back on this period and, and regret um, that I didn't show up as the as the mother mm -hmm. and the wife that I wanted to be. So, you know, I live and die by my calendar. I protect it. And I put in there what's important. Yeah. I love it. And that intentionality, I mean, the calendar can be used as a tool to your point. And I think if that, you know, a lot of people may not use that, that intentionally, and it could help. Absolutely. Yeah, I, absolutely. I can't even imagine. I put everything on there. Things are color coded. So when I look at it, like I have a sense of what's going on in my day. Is this a high client delivery day? Like, do I have a lot of meetings today? You know, am I like just in my creative zone today? So at a glance, I know I what it. I'm doing. I like it. Marcy. I am learning to be gentle with myself, learning to um, define my boundaries, um, softening them so that it's not so uh, so uh, aggressive when I need to say something. I have to put myself in timeout um, because you can't always put other people in timeout. So I'm learning <laughs> to put myself in timeout and, and then... And I'm, I'm still practicing this, but then I'll emerge. And um, so, you know, really for me, it's focusing, like uh, Melva said, uh, when's my high time? When do I know that I can rock and roll something? And then, you know, prioritizing that, you know, my to do's, my must to do's. And in my must to do's is, um, is my network, my support group, and making some smart decisions about when to. Um, change things around because you know everybody um needs a little marcy in their life but not everybody deserves it so <laughs> sometimes i have to put them on the sidelines <laughs> and that's okay because it's 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 mutually beneficial that way if i know that i'm not going to be at my best it, mentally emotionally if i'm not going to be present to show up then i i need to put myself in time out um you know i had a question like uh i guess it was maybe last summer and a high school girlfriend of mine addressed this. I've had a lot of loss in my life um, over recent years. And I said, you know, I don't have any children. Like, what is my legacy? I don't have any. Like, I borrow all my friends' kids. And they're like, no, Marcy, you're missing it. That um, your legacy is how you've made people feel. And all of the people in your life, whether they're colleagues, coworkers, volunteers, friends. And I thought about that. I said, you know, it's not the work that we do. Um, that's, you know, it's living and, you know, bringing myself, my A game to work, to volunteering, to friendships, showing up um, and being present in the moment. You know, all of us on this call today, phones down, completely like engrossed in the conversation because it was an hour, an hour of meaningful enrichment time. Um, so for me, that's that's how I'm learning to to do better um, and to kind of learn from those things that you see in the rear view mirror. You know, like being able to have friends that can call you on your stuff in a gentle way and say, yeah, I can see that, And but what can I do to fix this? How can I make things better? How can I learn and grow from it instead of, well, that was great, thanks for telling me, and then just moving along, you know, actually processing things better. I love that. And I love the fact that, you know, I love the fact that you said fix it. Sometimes you don't need to be fixed. The yeah. fix, you know, you just, you are who you are. Right. And that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm like, you know, take it, don't take it, modify, you know, like it's kind of like, I don't really, I'm not attached to the conclusion, you know, it's kind of, I think there's a little bit of a freedom to that. You know, to say I'm not married to the conclusion, and hey, it's okay. 
and I'm, you know, you do you, and I don't know. It's just a different place for me. So I completely mixing it up. Yeah, mixing it up in my bucket list, which was a hundred things, I, I shrunk it. What's my top twenty things? Let me actually cross something off that list before I have more <laughs> things I've never get done or seen. So being 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 realistic with myself. Yeah. Sometimes more is just more. Yeah. Right? yeah, you don't need to be in a race. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Jennifer, what about you? So mine was a, um, God, what were we talking about? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so mine was um, balancing family and work, yeah. right? And I was also very deliberate about, I have one daughter and, you know, what, I had a lot of demands in the jobs that I held. But I absolutely, I didn't miss any, I didn't miss anything unless there was just really no other choice, right? You're out of town or something. I was very, very deliberate about that time and balancing that with work. Don't get me wrong. I worked a lot of long hours and weekends and everything else, but I did it. I, I felt for the most part on my own terms. Um, and a lot of that was learning how to organize my time and how to manage it and, and what tasks were important and made a difference and which ones could you eliminate, right? A lot of people, sometimes you get caught up in got to do this, 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 this. And in reality, you probably had to do three of those things, not 10 of them. And um, I was, I got more and more deliberate as the years went by. So that's experience, but I was very deliberate about that. And then balancing that with my family was a huge priority. And, you know, if it didn't work around them, then I was like, okay, now we have to go to plan B and think of something else. And I also am like you, Marcy, and I'm quietly, I can be on, but I'm, I'm an introvert at heart too. And I need my downtime. When we would go to those Sue Ann to those conferences and things, I'd get home and I would be exhausted. And I, and I learned that about myself and I gave yeah. myself that space to just go, okay. And then you recharge and then you go at it again. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, you guys, can you believe it's already 930? What really? Where did the time go? <laughs> so um, I'm going to say gotta have since the whole title of the session was the gotta have. What's your one gotta have? Marcy, what's your one gotta have? Um, gotta have for in a workplace or in what? In life? In life. Gotta have. Joyful peace. Ooh, joyful peace. I love it. Melva, one freedom. Guy. Freedom. 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 Okay, I'm not going to start singing on the podcast. All right, Jennifer. Happiness. Happiness. Yep. And I'm going to say a whole life. So with that, everyone, aren't these women absolutely incredible? This is why I have them as friends as well as, you know, professional leaders, obviously wonderful, <laughs> but. They're personally my friends. So with that, Dana, come on back. And uh, I can't believe it. Another conversation. It just went so fast. Exactly. Uh, and it, it's so funny. I tell so many people when they come on, they're like, what are we going to talk about for an hour? I'm like, with the right people, it goes by so fast. You don't realize the hour has passed by. And this is another example. Every time um, Sue Ann brings some powerhouse, you know, people on the panel and it just goes by so quickly. You're taking all these nuggets and it, you can apply them or see how you can ingrain them into your own uh, career path in uh, your own life itself. So uh, definitely like to thank Marcy, Melva, and Jennifer for your time and also sharing your nuggets uh, with all of us uh, tonight and everything. And for those that are watching and want to know, like either wanting to book you at their uh, company or at an event or how to uh, reach out to book your services, can you tell them how they can reach out or follow you on social media? Uh, we'll start with Marcy. Oh, goodness gracious. 
<laughs> I've never been asked that question. They don't like me to share where I'm here in the witness protection program. You might have to go through screen. <laughs> it has been a complete joy and blessing to be here today. Um, and anytime you you want to have another conversation, I would look forward to it. Awesome. Contact I'm me over. if you want Marcy and then she can screen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am on LinkedIn, uh, not active user as much as I used to be, but uh, I am on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you have to go through the Moana Nui podcast, who will then go through C A P A W and then get approval, and then we'll connect you to Marcy. <laughs> there's a process and there's a process and procedure. Exactly. <laughs> you have to go through two levels of, uh, of uh, verification and approval. That's right. We may need to do some process <laughs> improvements. <laughs> I'm going to filter my dating app through you next, Dana. And then we have a third line of defense. <laughs> Melva has a more straightforward. Uh, <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm Melva Holt, the management maven. You can find me on Instagram, Melva Holt, or my handle's management maven. Um, but the mint management is missing the E. Um, but if you search Melva Holt, you can find it or visit me at paceleadership.com, P A I S E. Okay, that needed a Gantt chart. Yeah. <laughs> more straightforward though all right Jennifer well <laughs> Jennifer also has to go through the Moana Nui podcast and yes and <laughs> Sue Ann yes. yes call Sue Ann she can find me <laughs> Facebook and Instagram is probably about it I'm not real active on LinkedIn anymore well, why is this the hardest question <laughs> the whole night why is this the hardest question <laughs> <laughs> Out of all the questions, I asked the hardest one. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. <laughs> we well, do not have fun at these pots because we're very serious. Okay. <laughs> but sometimes you need some laughter. It, it's that glue to keep that rapport going, that conversation going, and building that bridge at everything. So, so basically, uh, this, tell me. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> any of these individuals. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, everybody, I thank everybody who's watching live and those that are watching on the recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, definitely like, subscribe, and click the notification button so you will get the notification of when our episodes go live so you don't miss any of them. You can uh, interact with us in the conversation, uh, in the comment section, ask questions and such, um, because we always have our Develop Your Talent segment with Sue Ann on the third Thursday of every month at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. So definitely put it on your calendar so you can tune in for some of these nuggets and things to help you develop not only your talent, but also your professional development to help you on your path uh, of wherever you want to go in your career. Uh, with all of that, everyone, we'd like to thank each of you for tuning in. Um, also, a friendly reminder, um, as you see at the bottom of the screen, you see a QR code. Uh, scan that. That QR code is with a local organization in Maui that is boots on the ground helping the families that are affected by the fires in, uh, in Maui and helping those families with getting the items that they need and helping them through this process. It is not a short-term um, thing. This is going to be years to come to rebuild Lahaina and everything and helping those families uh, to get back to where they were. Um, a lot of them, they can only stay in the temporary places for sometimes days, maybe a week at a time, and they have to relocate. So these families in the last month has been relocated four different times uh, mm -hmm. while trying to still get their homes back um, that was lost in the fire. So if you have it in, in, in your heart to donate or even do research of some of the stuff that they need help with and connect them to other organizations that can help, please scan that and reach out to the organization 
um, that is there. That way you can make you can ensure your money and anything you're doing is going straight to those families in um, Maui that desperately need it. But everyone, we'd like to thank you for tuning in with the Moana Nui podcast. We stream live every Thursday at 7 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. every Thursday. We look forward to seeing you next week. And everybody, we hope you have a great evening and have a wonderful weekend. Everyone, bye, everyone. So many stories left to tell Even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf If they won't tell it, we will If this the land of the free, it was a freedom then When they annexed Hawaii and called it see the lands Without any type of payment and no signing off Called themselves a republic in 1894 1.2 million acres overtaken from the native Hawaiians When they resisted, the West retaliated in violence and erasure The Hawaiian language is banned As part of colonialism's plan to expand, yeah Stuck between a rock and a hard place Multiple bombings of Koholave As a part of their ongoing war with Asia Used it as a place for target practice No consent or compensation Colonizers call for annexation No work out for all the locals School will never let you know So many stories left to tell Even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf If we won't tell it, we will Too many stories left to tell Even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf If we won't tell it, we will We will So if we put Hawaii in a perspective Well, black and Asian history is interconnected Considering the fight with the Pacific Then of course, versus Asia, they was treated as a middleman for war But they didn't let the western colorism run its course Cause dark skin was a sign of dignity to call The land was taken in the name of capitalism When prior to it was an actual kingdom Clap back at the system Stuck between a rock and a hard place Multiple bombings of Koholave As a part of their ongoing war with Asia Used it as a place for target practice No consent or compensation Colonizers call for annexation no work out for all the locals, school will never let you know So many stories left to tell, even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf, if we won't tell it, we will So many stories left to tell, even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf, if we won't tell it, we will So many stories left to tell, even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf, if if he won't tell it, we will Too many stories left to tell Even if we have to ourselves Can't keep history on the shelf If he won't tell it, we will We will